Welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us today for the seventh lecture in the University of Regina's 2021 Research with Impact series. My name is Harold Reamer and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Kinesiology and Health Studies and I'm going to be your host today. Over the next hour you're going to hear from Dr. Elizabeth Cooper who is an assistant professor with us here in the faculty. Before I officially introduce Dr. Cooper, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are gathered virtually on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, the ancestral lands of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis, on whose territories the University of Regina resides, and where my family and I live, work, and play. The University of Regina's alumni department, together with the Lifelong Learning Center, is pleased to offer the Research with Impact series virtually. Since the previous sessions were so well received, the alumni department and the Lifelong Learning Center have decided to continue the series throughout the fall. Check out the alumni website for details on the next lecture with the University of Regina President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Jeff Keshen, and that'll take place on November 16th. Uh, someone is going to be entering in the alumni website address into the chat, so look for that there. I'm excited to hear from Dr. Cooper today, and I hope that today's talk will inspire you to come back for future sessions this fall, particularly Jeff's in November. Now, I want to point out that this session and these sessions that we do are recorded and are posted on the U of R alumni website so that you can watch the presentations again or you can share them with other people who you might know. Again, you're gonna see the link to the alumni website in the chat. And if you'd like to access the video later, please do so. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our seventh speaker in the Research with Impact series, Dr. Elizabeth Cooper. As I mentioned earlier, Elizabeth is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Health Studies at the University of Regina. Her work, her research work in particular, focuses on what she refers to as wicked problems or things that fall into the gray zone that need a diverse group of people around the table to actually find solutions. She's worked with teams across all of Canada and in New Zealand, Australia, India, Kenya, Colombia, the United States, and other parts of the world. She's currently working on projects that try to address issues around immigrants and vaccines, the suicide and opioid crisis in Saskatchewan, the ever mounting wait times to see medical specialists, and what does self-care really look like for busy professionals at risk for burnout? This past year, we've been consistently reminded that we're all in this together, or we are in the same water, but we're not in the same boat. And while these phrases are often used in the context of COVID-19, it's also applicable to the health and wellness of people within our society as a whole. The key part of being healthy is prioritizing mental wellness and ongoing fatigue from dealing with day-to-day -day realities. Today, Dr. Cooper will be talking about how the people she works with who identify as Indigenous, as migrants, as neurodiverse, and as caregivers discuss self-care, community care, and how to move beyond Band-Aid solutions to achieve their vision of a better tomorrow. Following Dr. Cooper's presentation, we'll have about 15 minutes for a question and answer session. Herta from the Lifelong Learning Center will be moderating the question and answer. As you listen to Dr. Cooper's presentation and you have a question, please put your questions in the chat feature, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Herta will then share these with Dr. Cooper shortly after her presentation ends. And we'll do our best to get to as many questions as time allows. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to virtual floor over to Dr. Cooper. Elizabeth. Thank you very much. So I'd like to acknowledge that um, I'm from Treaty One territory. My family is uh, of settler ancestry and I'm seventh generation on the prairies. My grandmother was born around Kansak in Saskatchewan and my grandfather in 
Swan River, Manitoba, and my father's family, his parents were born in Winnipeg. I moved to, after I did, lived most of my life on Treaty 1 territory, I moved to the unceded territories of the uh, Stolo peoples in British Columbia for a couple of years after I finished my PhD before moving here, where I currently am a visitor and live on Treaty 4 territory and the homeland of, and of the Métis Nation. So today I'm really going to focus a bit on waitlist issues and how that affects people's mental health, well-being, and what we're trying to do. I'm going to talk about research from a couple different projects and some conversations I've been having. The research I either have um, ethics approval for, or there's one story that I'm going to tell you about where I, it's from a friend of mine and she's given me permission to share her story. It's really important that we think about what we can do to improve the lives of people in our province, in our country and in our world. Oftentimes, we really focus on one little thing and it leaves people in the dust. And that doesn't help anything. It's really important as health professionals, as academics, as citizens that we acknowledge where we come from, we acknowledge our biases and we acknowledge our agenda. What we have seen, what we've heard, what we've experienced shapes who we are. So here you can see some pictures of me with uh, friends and research participants in Kenya, in India, in BC, in Manitoba, and then one picture at the top with my dog, who maybe is my most trusted research companion. And some of the time I've spent thinking over the last 20 years about what research looks like in communities, what health looks like in communities, what mental health looks like in communities, and how we can support children to grow up to lead the lives that they want to leave and they deserve to lead which often is being able to live a life at all. Work I've done around wait lists includes COPD research. It includes cancer research, cancer diagnoses. It includes people with disabilities accessing supports and services. It includes mental health. It includes people who are in the sandwich generation, those who are caring for both aging parents aunts, uncles, as well as children. When people are on wait lists for a long time, what we end up seeing, or when they are caring for people who are on wait lists, and some of what I'm gonna talk about are children who are on wait lists. What we see is polypharmacy use. So people who are on multiple prescription drugs. We see people with increasing high blood pressure, increasing rates of type two diabetes, we see people who are forgetful and really struggling. We see sleeplessness and loss of work. Sometimes loss of work is because people are so uh, at odds with what they should do. Sometimes it's because they have to care for someone. Sometimes it's because they really just cannot work physically. We look at self-harm and people experiencing increased rates of self-harm. We see increased rates of violence amongst other people. We see anxiety and restlessness, hopelessness. We see people turning to substances, both legal and illegal. We see people who are working 120 hour days. We see people staying up all night and all day trying to get everything done they need to get done to care for the people they love. And with that, we see people withdrawing from family and friends. There's a shame in waiting. There shouldn't be a shame in waiting, but there's a shame in waiting. And to address that shame, sometimes people seek their own answers. They look on the internet, they ask friends, if they still have friends they're talking to, what they can do. And sometimes this looks like really dangerous actions and activities that people undertake. We've seen that with COVID-19 where people were so desperate that they followed advice and were drinking bleach. We've seen that with people turning to veterinary medicine. We've seen that in so many different instances. And really what this boils down to is the sense of what can I do and how can I address some of the problems that I see in my own life and how can I help those who are struggling that I care for do better. And sometimes the people who are struggling are the people who are watching. So whether it's people who are on a wait list or a family and friends and loved ones who are watching people, or the care providers who are watching and waiting and trying to do something. What are we fighting for when we talk about wait lists and we talk about health and we talk about Band-Aid solutions? This uh, little girl is Fiona. 
Fiona's a good friend of mine's daughter. And I started talking to my friend Alina, and this is, uh, I talked to her just before actually doing this presentation, just to confirm she was okay with me using these pictures again and showed her the slides. And Fiona is five, and she, so some of these pictures are a little older, and she's nonverbal. She is diagnosed with global spectrum disorder, autism, and self-injurious behavior. This means that there have been instances where she has escaped from her house, so she's eloped, and she's been found down the block, down the street, naked, and jumping on neighbor's trampolines, which is why her mom bought her a trampoline for in her backyard. She smears fecal matter. She does not sleep at night. She eats rocks. She eats wallpaper. She engages in really difficult behaviors. And it's very hard on the family. When COVID-19 first started, provinces were tasked with coming up with a plan for what do we do if our ICUs become full, which unfortunately is what we're looking at here now, uh, a year and a half later. Ontario, part of their initial plan was to deny children like Fiona care. The official plan that was leaked was that children with complicated special needs would be triaged. They would not receive medical help. And it didn't matter if it was for COVID-19 or if it was for some other reason, these children would be left to die. And my friend Alina is an epidemiologist and she's very aware of what would happen with a pandemic and what that could look like. And she called me crying and saying, what do we do? What do I do about my daughter? How do I keep her safe? And I started to look into this some more and I started to talk with colleagues across the country and so what do we do to keep people like Fiona safe? What do we do to help people like Fiona? What do we do to help Alina who's waiting, who's trying to get services and supports? Luckily, advocates were able to come out and get some of these plans changed so that children and seniors with complex medical needs would still receive care if they needed it during a pandemic. I really like this image that the Ontario Autism Coalition just came out with not that long ago, showing the number of people who the Sky Dome could hold and the number of people waiting for supports and services. In Regina, the wait for diagnosis for autism, according to the Autism Services of Saskatoon, uh, is over four years. We see about one third of the people on wait lists being diagnosed. And just because somebody's diagnosed does not mean they get access to treatment or services or supports. And treatment services and supports look like nutritionists, it looks like behavior experts, it looks like sleep experts, it looks like geneticists. There's a whole team that needs to be in place. For children under six, the wait time is a little bit less because it gets streamlined into different services. But in Saskatchewan, it's still about 18 months, which if you think about it, that's extremely long to be waiting, especially when you're trying to figure out what's going on with your little one. For adults, it can be a couple of years for people to get diagnoses. For children over the age of six, it's about two years in Saskatoon. And like I said, it's a, rates are upwards of four years here. Where does that leave people? And that's just for a diagnosis, that's not for supports and services. We don't report on the number of cases. We don't report on wait list times. We ask for help, we ask for it. We constantly are asking how long does it take to get into services or supports? How long is, I work on some research around COPD. How long is it going to take to get spirometry results? How long is it going to take to see a respirologist? Personally, I'm on a wait list for an allergist in Regina after having a severe allergic reaction recently. And I was informed after being on a wait list for five months that my referral never went in. And we know this because there are no allergists currently accepting adult patients in Regina. Where does that leave people who don't work in this field, who don't know to double check? Wait lists are often driven by funding and accessibility issues. 
We do not have enough specialists. We do not have enough labs. We do not have enough services. We do not have enough transportation. It, and we do not have enough supports. So when I've asked healthcare practitioners, if you had two hopes and a dream to fix our healthcare system, what would you say? And almost undoubtedly, I get told, we need funding to hire people. We need funding to hire people. There need to be jobs and it needs to be competitive funding to bring in the experts. Because unless there's a reason for people to come to Saskatchewan, unless there is some driver such as competitive funding, we're not going to get the people we need and the wait lists are just going to keep growing and people are gonna to have to move. Sometimes people do, they move to get supports. We should never have to have people move out of our province so that they can get the supports and services they need because all they're being told is, well, if you keep waiting, eventually we'll get to you. When I've talked to academics and healthcare practitioners about what we need to do to make this work, to fix problems, to address burnout, to address challenges, one of the things that someone told me is we're so trained to solve problems we're really looking at how we fix the problems. And we're really thinking about that deficit base. We're looking at the challenges instead of looking at those solutions. When you saw that picture, those pictures of Fiona, you saw a smiling, happy, bubbly kid. And that is not necessarily what people's records say, what their medical information says. It's not looking at the whole person. But if we can start looking at the whole person, if we can start looking at the good too, it makes working up, sitting on those wait lists a little bit better and a little bit easier to take. Often we talk about how we need to pull down the healthcare system. This is a picture from my very first house I had. It was built in 1904. It had extra walls that had been added. It had 10 layers of wallpaper. It had four layers of flooring and it didn't pull down the house. It pulled down to get to the layers, to get to the base, to get to that foundation. Within the healthcare system, often we talk about how we need to just take it all down and we need to start fresh. That's not reasonable. It's not evidence-based, it's not realistic. What we need to do instead is we need to take things down to the bones. We need to look at the structure. We need to look at what's going on and we need to renovate. If we keep building on top and on top and on top, which is what we currently do, eventually it's gonna collapse. It's gonna to get too high and it's not gonna be sustainable and everything below is going to crash. Instead, what we need to do is we need to really pull everything apart, figure out what's working, figure out what's not working, listen, listen to the people who matter, listen to the patients, the clients, the families, listen to the teachers, listen to the social workers, and then try and put back a healthcare system that's even better than it ever was to start with. Waitlist issues are often driven by how we define health and what constitutes evidence. However, if we don't have the evidence, we can't find solutions. Last year, the Saskatchewan suicide prevention bill was, or sorry, not last year, this past spring, the suicide and prevention bill was passed. The initial recommendations for this bill and the base of it passed through the, at the federal level back in 2012, but it was not until 2021 that Saskatchewan adopted the main core issue, which is the suicide is a public health issue. It's not a mental health issue. Mental health issue as well, but it stems often from public health challenges. In 2019, the bill was proposed and, uh, sorry, it should, this should read Act 601. The bill was proposed and it was voted down. In 2020, it was voted down. And at that point, Tristan DeRocher walked down from LaRange to try and raise awareness about the suicide issue in Saskatchewan. And the TP you see there, there's pictures around it of people who lost their lives to suicide and people beside this TP who were remembering and thinking, praying, talking about what we can do differently. Saskatchewan has the highest rates of suicide in Canada at 38.9 per 100,000 as of 2018. 90 out of every 100,000 uh, 
people who die uh, are Indigenous men, and 50 per 100,000 people are Indigenous women under the age, between the ages of 10 to 19 for the women and for girls. That's a lot of deaths, especially when we're looking at a population that makes up 16% of our population in the province and about 4% in the country. So overdose deaths, accidents, often these are not counted within suicide, but often they are. I'm doing some research and some work right now with Indigenous men, and we're looking to see what can we do to make sure that children grow up to be healthy and safe and to feel supported. What the Suicide Prevention Act is looking at is trying to get better evidence, trying to know who's dying, why are they dying, where are they dying, what's going on, what supports do they have in the first place. Because unless we have that evidence, unless we understand, it's not going to help much. We can open as many beds as we want, but if people don't have homes to go to, if they don't have family, if they don't have jobs, if they don't have water to drink and food to eat that are safe, we're just going to keep seeing people feeling helpless. And as people do wait for some of these supports and services, as they wait for housing, as they wait, the mental health challenges continue to rise. We're working with some kids and we were talking about what do you need to be healthy? And this child said, and he's talking about health, right? So how do we understand what it means to be healthy? When I feel respected, when my opinion matters, and it might be that no, every, not everybody agrees with me, and that's okay because everyone has a different opinion, but respect is when I can express myself and not feel like I'm going to be attacked or made fun of for those opinions. And this is from a research project with children between the ages of seven and 13. Waitlist issues are often driven by lack of collaboration, it's that lack of respect. It's a lack of people listening to each other. It's a lack of thinking outside the box. Mental health and mental well-being. Um, the 10th of October was um, a mental health day worldwide. Often it's because we don't talk about these issues. We're silent. And we hope that everything's going to get better. And unless we work together, unless we have everybody around the table, including those who are often made vulnerable by our policies and procedures, we're not going to be seeing changes. We're not going to see a reduction in wait lists. What we often see is one person moves from one wait list to another, to another, to another. Move from a wait list for a need replacement to a wait list for, or a wait list for pain management to a wait list for a knee replacement to a wait list for the next thing and the next thing address waitlist issues, to address wicked problems, we need to look, learn from multiple contexts. We need to look and see what's happening and what people are doing, and we need to find ways to listen and acknowledge the challenges people are facing. So the one picture you see is from a project that was done to raise awareness about missing and murdered Indigenous women. The top of moccasins were designed, some were moccasin tops from and bounce from people who have uh, found themselves or have been found on the missing and murdered Indigenous women's list. Some are made in commemoration and some were made um, for specific people and some were made for just in general. And this was at Batoche in Saskatchewan, the final installation. And it was people came together to talk about what's going on that we've lost so many people. I do work in India as well. And in India, one of the things that we see a lot is children who are dying. And we also see violence with women to, against women as well, and people who are gender diverse. But there are some interesting solutions that we can have if we work together and we think together. There's a project that is going on that's looking at different barriers that prevent children, especially girls, from receiving insulin. One of the problems with insulin is that it does cost money. And if you don't have money, what do you do? But the other problem is that it needs to be refrigerated. It doesn't do, insulin does not do well when it's plus 40 degrees. So this organization looked across the world and they looked at what's happened in the past and they pulled it down to renovate. And there is this clay that if you add water to it, stays cold enough. So they custom made some fridges that are just big enough for the vials of insulin. And 
This way, they've been able to give insulin to girls who have type 1 diabetes so they can stay alive. And families don't need to have clean water and they don't need to have electricity and they can be uh, housing insecure and they can still be okay and those girls can still live and they can still go to school. And it's through looking at what's going on, it's through working together and thinking about creative solutions that we can find ways to help people while they're waiting. Because what these these families, these girls are waiting for is for some better housing. And this will keep them healthy while they wait. And then when they do get into better housing, what we've seen with some of the children and their families is then the fridges can go on to another person who can use it. Safe places need to be brave spaces. So a brave, a safe space, we all often think of as a place where you're not going to be discriminated against, where you're going to be able to be heard, where people are going to listen, where you're not going to be a victim of violence. A brave space is a space where you can stand up and you can say what's going on and you can share your story. It's a place that holds space for people. We were talking about what do we need for safe spaces and brave spaces. And the child said, kind of cool. I'd never thought there'd be a place like that helping. That's quite the statement from a child to make that they didn't think of a healthcare environment as somewhere that would be helping. I have the same comment about schools and about other resource centers. It, we need to save places as somewhere you can go to be helped. And that help might come in terms of food. It might come in terms of having somebody to talk to. It might be somewhere that is a safe injection site. It may be somewhere where you can do rehabilitation. It may be somewhere where you can just be yourself. But we need to be thinking outside the box and we need to be working together to create these spaces. And then have healthcare practitioners, have health services into these spaces that people already feel safe in so that they can be open and honest about what's going on in their lives. We need to use a harm reduction and continuum of care approach. So this is a picture from Winnipeg where I was working with some women, mothers, aunties, grandmothers, and Indigenous girls. And when we talk about harm reduction, often we think about safe injection sites or we think about needle deposits. But what harm reduction is, is a ground up approach. It's looking for what's going on in people's lives. What can we do so they feel supported, so they feel heard, so that we're meeting them where they're at and accepting them where they're at, whatever's going on. The same thing can be true for rehab. It can be true for like with uh, broken bones. It can be true for people who have lost pregnancies. It can be true across the board. How do we take people who've experienced trauma and weightless or trauma? And how do we help them through? How do we go from community to medical, to social services, to workplaces? and really take care of people. A lot of the time we need to, what we're really looking at is meeting people where we're at and following the pace that they're willing to go. It cannot be our pace, it has to be theirs. Because if we meet people with, at their pace, then we're going to be able to have change that's sustainable and we'll be able to help people as they wait for more supports and services. Who are we fighting for? We're fighting for children like um, Lucas in the green shirt and Lyndon in the black hat. We're fighting for children like Lexi, who's writing on the board and the word she was writing was her name and she was writing love. Because when we ask these children, what do you need to feel supported? What do we need to be healthy? Lexi said, what we need is a place for people to listen and to love. Wouldn't that be a nice healthcare model if we could kind of come from this place of compassion? And if we come from a place of compassion, we're going to be more understanding when people talk about how they're feeling frustrated about wait lists. And maybe we can try and avoid some of those challenges we saw in the first place in that very first slide. Our healthcare backpack currently looks like checklists and consultation. It looks like standards of care, and drugs and therapies. It looks like labeling people as having underlying conditions. It looks like stereotypes and it looks like privilege. We need to 
think about these things. We need to think about what does that do if people have complex problems, complex challenges? We're not all in the same situation. We're not all experiencing the same challenges. Even when we see restrictions like with COVID-19, we are not all in the same boat. Somebody who is like me, who has the fortunate opportunity to work at home is in a very different situation than somebody who is a gig worker, who has to be out in public, who is working for minimum wage, who's worried about losing their job if they go and get a vaccine and something goes wrong. We need to think about who the consultations are with and what is that standard of care and when does that standard of care start? And can we do something better? What if instead we packed our backpack with prescriptions for leisure and time supports? What if we really looked at what culture is in community and family? What if we looked at wraparound care? What if we had patient navigators? What if we had translators and we had people who had gone through experiences? What if we had people who could say, you've been on a wait list for five months after having a severe allergic reaction, that's too long, it was an emergency, you need to get in right away, who then could call up and help and see what was going on. What if we had people who could say, yeah, you're having trouble getting to that medical appointment because you broke your right foot and you can't drive. What can we do to get you a voucher so that you can take a cab? What if we actually had appropriate funding to do renovations to people's homes, to provide behavior supports, to help people out? Upstream interventions, are the story with upstream and downstream is that there are all these people, these children were drowning in the river and people are jumping in and they're pulling them out, they're pulling them out, they're pulling them out. And then somebody goes a little bit further up and says, okay, so what's going on? And they see these kids kind of like holding onto branches and they're in the middle and they say, okay, we should do something in this middle here. We should set up programs, set up supports, do something. And they look around, they say, where's our other friend? That person had gone to the top and had been trying to prevent children from jumping off the cliff and ending up in the rapids. So our upstream approach is that when we're looking at what's going on at government level, what's going on at policy levels. Midstream is maybe, depends on what it is, but that would be what's happening within your cities, what's happening within organizations. And downstream is like what's actually on the ground going on, who's giving out those food stamps, who's giving out the soup, who's giving out the socks, who's taking some resources to tent camps and tent, commun tent communities. So what if we looked at what's happening on the ground and tried to track it back to see where things are falling apart? What if we did that? What would our healthcare system look like? And what would the experiences then look like for people who are on a wait list? So sometimes wait lists are used as a tool by burned up professionals to defer dealing with challenging situations. I have a colleague in British Columbia who has a current wait list of over 1,000 children. Just let that sink in again, a wait list of over 1,000 children to see one specialist. That keeps my colleague up at night keeps my colleague worried about what's going to happen to these thousand children. We know for people who have someone close to them who's died by, because of suicide, that there are six other people whose lives are changed and to the point where it's never the same. It's not just grief, it's addiction issues, it's mental health, it's that what if, what if something could have been different? Six people. Now we see the wait list issues. We see professionals who are really at a loss because they don't have the tools and they don't have the supports. What do you do when you have a child who is five, who has tried, done so much self-harm that you're worried about their life, which are some of the kids that I've seen and worked with. What do you do when you're talking to families and they're telling you about all the challenges that are going on and it's not related to their appointment? 
So sometimes it's easier to put a child on a wait list to see somebody else because maybe that other person is going to have better solutions. And that's not okay. It's not an okay model. It's not okay to kind of shift where the challenges are, but sometimes people are so burnt out. They're working such long hours. They're working with the tools they have in their backpack. And some of those tools just don't work. And sometimes people hope and they think that maybe their colleague won't be as burnt out. Maybe their colleague won't be having some of the same challenges. Maybe their colleague will be feeling different and maybe they'll be able to cope. We talk to different health professionals. A lot of the time I hear comments like this, how can I be so privileged when other people aren't? We think and talk a lot about self-care. Self-care is an industry. It really is a, an industry by bubble bath and our candles and our massages and people are very upset at the start of the pandemic because they maybe couldn't get their hair done or they couldn't go and do what they thought of often as self-care. When I talk to academics and I talk to health professionals who work with communities who are often made vulnerable through no fault of their own, what we people talked a lot about was this idea of how self-care is unpacking problems with somebody else. It's about building that support network so you have people to talk to. And I think this is a really good thing to remember that self-care can be about having people you can unpack challenges with. This isn't about breaking confidentiality. This is about having people that you can say, look, I'm not doing okay. I just lost somebody else that I work with, that I care with. A couple of days ago, I received an email. I volunteer with Girl Guides. And I received an email saying that a long-term volunteer with Girl Guides passed away because of COVID. And I'm new, I'm new to the city, I'm new to the province, I've been here for two years. So I said, what's going on? How are you feeling? Would you like me to tell other people? And they said, could you please? And so I did. Because sometimes self-care is about having people that you can turn to who you can lean on and recognize when people need to lean on you. But it's also about building better habits and recognizing what's going on. And sometimes it's the little things. When I was working with some children, I asked them, what would your perfect day be like? What do you need? These kids were, everybody was struggling. Every single child knew someone who died um, because of violence. And I said, what do you need to be okay? And Ask the parents, what do you want to do to make sure your perfect day with your kids? Everything's good. No, there's no limitations. What would you do? And the parent said stuff like, I'd go shopping and I'd buy my kid anything they wanted. Or I'd go to Disney World or I would buy a brand new house and they'd have their own bedroom. And without fail, things the children said is, I want to have tea with my family. I want to sit outside by the river and read a storybook with my family. One kid, this was fantastic and probably my, one of my favorite memories and favorite moments. The kid said, I want to play janitor. And I asked the kid, what's janitor? And she said, that's when mom and dad sit on the couch with their feet up and I clean the house. And the parents assured me that they clean too, but that it's just what they called that. But that's what the kid's perfect day is. It's about being with people that you care about and having people to unpack things with. We know people can imagine a better future. They do better in life. But we can't leave people waiting indefinitely. We cannot leave people waiting for years and years and years while health continues to deteriorate, both mental and physical. We need to think about where people can see themselves and where we can see the future of healthcare going. How can we move beyond just surface fixes? How can we make and create change? Some of the greatest prevent suicide preventions and harm preventions uh, includes reducing opioid use, re uh, which by the way, in Saskatchewan has increased by, deaths have increased by about 110% since 2004 because of overdoses. This year alone, we're, at, we're nearing 300 deaths. But one of the biggest things is if people can see a different future, if they have at least three people in their lives, they can ask for help. And 
if they're having trouble and at least one of them will say, you value, you're valuable, I don't want you to do these things. If people feel pride in who they are and what they do in their communities and in their workplaces. So we need, we know that's what we need for people to do well and to have better futures. So what, how can we do this? And we need to do it by working together. Uh, I really like this quote by an academic. So I don't think anyone's ever changed the world. I mean, the world just kind of changes itself. And maybe some people are capable of nudging it in one direction or another direction. And I think one of the biggest things that I would call people to do is think about how do you want to nudge the world? We can't do it all, right? No one person can do everything. No one person is going to be able to solve all the wait list times. They're not going to be able to have people go and get extra training so that they can read test results. There's a lot of tests where people will go and get the test, but have to go to a specialist to be able to read it, to be able to provide information. Nobody is going to be able to do everything, but what can we do and who can we work with so that we can kind of nudge it in the right direction? And I would argue that even the thought of being able to nudge things and to be open to talking with people about what you're seeing, to be open to saying it's not right, what we're doing is not right, and sitting around the table with multiple people, multiple personalities, multiple experiences, acknowledging our biases, acknowledging our privileges, acknowledging our experiences, and saying, what can we do to bring those people up from the, those lifeboats? And what can we do is that we're all walking forward in the same direction. So thank you very much. And I think I'm gonna open the floor to any questions and um, that you might have. Thanks, Dr. Cooper. Herta, do you have uh, questions queued up for Dr. Cooper? Actually, there is no questions in the chat. If anyone wants to ask a question, please unmute yourself and ask it. Hi. Hi. There's lots of talk about you know, funding being required, but where is all this funding supposed to come from? Sometimes it's about looking at where we're currently spending money. So if we actually do a really good audit of what we're spending money on and how we're spending our money, we can see where some of the different gaps are and we can redistribute it. So sometimes it's not even about like printing money or having more money come in, but it's about looking at where our resources are. And if we can stop challenges at the forefront, if we can make sure that we're not going to be moving into chronic care, then we're going to have more money that we can put into having specialists. For example, with COPD, so um, chronic obstruct, uh, obstructive pulmonary disease. If we get people diagnosed early and we get people on the right medications early and watch them and see when people are starting to have flare ups, we can reduce some of the time spent in emergency. We can reduce people being placed into put into the hospital. And COPD care and management is a chronic disease and it is the most expensive to treat in the hospital. So if we can reduce this, if we can reduce instances where people end up in the hospital, then we'll have more money that we can put into other supports and services. But until we do a good economic analysis, until we actually look at where some of the costs are, we are going to have a, continue to have a hard time finding those funds. But ultimately, if we look and see where those costs are, we'll get, be able to redistribute the money so that we can put it into preventative care and put it into not redoing the same thing. We do a lot of stuff in health that is the same thing. So we'll have somebody having, um, it's a good example. So we'll have somebody getting mental health support in one place, and then we'll have them getting the same mental health support in another place and another place and another place. So it'll, with some of the behavior uh, supports for kids with, uh, autism and autistic families, autistic kids and autism families, one of the things we'll see is children getting resources in schools and in healthcare centers and in drop-in programs and paying for it privately. So if we could streamline that, 
then we'd be able to free up some money that we could use towards other things. And ultimately people's lives would be better too. Okay, I do have a question from uh, Milan. How can we, as a lay person, help with the upstream intervention? A lot of the time we talk about letter writing campaigns, write to your MLA, that always helps. Uh, I would suggest you write to more than just your MLA, that you write to all the MLAs. You can reach out to organizations that work with these populations and these issues. So if something that you're passionate about is diabetes, reach, reach out and say, what can I do to help? Because often there are organizations that require volunteers and rely on volunteers or rely on donations. If you do make a donation, really watch where your money is going. So I used to do fund development and we, some organizations, the money went into direct care, the money went into research, whereas others, the money went into, um, went to very high salaries. So watch where you're giving your money, make sure that they've got a good track record. But ultimately find something you're passionate about and contact that organization. There's Halloween's coming up and I have severe life-threatening food allergies. And one of the things for kids at Halloween who have food allergies is it can be very dangerous to get different food you're allergic to. But there's a teal light campaign. And the teal light campaign is that people with a pumpkin that's painted teal or some lights that are teal around their house will have safe non-food treats for kids. And that recently the province was looking for, or, Allergy Association was looking for different places in the province that could be lit up teal, where kids could go and have safe trick-or-treating with food-free treats. So you can get involved in things like that. And it can be really fun. I mean, it's kind of fun to be giving out toys to kids for Halloween and still making a difference. And when you do that, that's a really great place to start. And then you can build and it can fit your interests. It might end up being that you talk to the media it might end up be that you keep working with families. It might end up be that you're that listening ear, or it might end up being that you're the person with the six million dollars that you gave to build a new facility that can change so many lives. But every single life matters, and the biggest thing for people doing well in life is knowing that they're heard, that they're supported, and that somebody cares, and somebody who doesn't need to cares. So. I think that's that's the first thing and maybe the most important thing. Are there any other questions for Dr. Cooper? I have no more in the chat. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And in particular, I'd like to thank Dr. Cooper for sharing her expertise and time on this uh, really important topic. Just a, by way of reminder, the video of today's Research with Impact uh, lecture is gonna be posted uh, very shortly on the alumni section of the website. And again, a link to the website can be found in the chat and you should be, you should feel free to share that link with other people, your family and your friends and those of, uh, who you might know that might be interested in this uh, topic. And again, don't forget to check the University of Regina website for information on other lectures coming in this series and a variety of other activities that are going on on the campus uh, this fall. As I mentioned earlier, the U of Regina's Research with Impact series has been extended again through the fall, and it's going to continue with our next lecture on November 16th, where our new president and vice chancellor, Dr. Jeff Chesson, will be presenting. Again, uh, the alumni website has registration details and more information about that event. So I hope we'll see many of you on November 16th, same place, virtually, same time, noon till 1 p.m. I hope that you'll be able to join us. Again, thank you, Elizabeth and Herta for uh, hosting today and speaking today. And I wanna wish everyone a very wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thank you.
Thank you for coming.